Thank you. Well, it is once again great to be back in the People's Republic of Portland. And uh, it's very exciting for me uh, to hear that I'd gotten uh, a, a job title change, that I work at the New York Times. Actually, we've been iced out of the New York Times for so long that maybe people just think by us talking about it, we must work there. But uh, anyway, we were, you know, as we were driving in um, today, we were coming down from Seattle. And um, so just a few hours ago, one of the people in the car, we were packed in five of us in the car, Asked, so, you know, what's the deal with Portland? What's so special about this place? Because we were all sort of very enthusiastic and happy to be here. And so we started to explain a little. This is a, this is a town where there's, if there's not more bicyclists than car, there's more bicyclists with attitudes that they're bigger than cars. <laughs> And that there are two kinds of vehicles here, those that run on decaf and those that run on calf. Um, I always remember when I came, uh, one of the first times I came to Oregon was on assignment for Mother Jones a few years back looking at actually the collapse of the school system. Uh, Oregon had become, uh, this was not that long ago, uh, kind of the, a symbol of what happens, how you can destroy one of the best school systems in the nation by simply removing all the taxes and watching all these systems implode. And, you know, so I'm going around the state interviewing people and saying, well, how did this happen? I mean, Oregon is known as a, you know, pretty progressive-minded state, and somebody corrected me. He said, no, no, well, to understand Oregon, imagine Alabama plus Eugene and Portland stuck on in the middle. <laughs> so that's, that's always uh, <coughs> stuck in my mind. But anyway, it's, um, this is the, we're now embarked on an, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 city tour to begin um, talking about our third book, Standing Up to the Madness. And we have come to Portland for each of our two previous books, The Exception to the Rulers in 2004, Static in 2006. And this is always one of my favorite stops. And it's in part, a big part, because of the vibrancy of the independent media that you have here. The fact that the Baghdad is always teeming with an audience that is interested and informed and eager to uh, share their stories, hear some more stories from us, I think is a testament to what you have that unfortunately too many other communities don't have, which is that you, ha you in Kebu and your other independent media have this sanctuary for dissent. You have access to the other points of view. So that now when we hear the corporate media ramping up, beating the drums for war again, this time in Iran instead of Iraq, you know better. You're way ahead of the curve. You know you're being lied to and that this, this is a new propaganda campaign. And that is so important in a community and so important to a democracy. Which leads me to the book we've just written. We open, Standing Up to the Magnus very much grows out of our travels over these last um, bunch of years with our other books where every place we would go People like you, in addition to coming up and we would sign books, we're always talking to people and we're hearing stories everywhere we go about communities, about resistance, about grassroots uprising. And some of the stories that struck us the most were the ones that came from the most improbable places and the most improbable people. And we finally decided we needed a book just to tell those stories. The subtitle of Standing Up to the Madness is Ordinary Heroes in Extraordinary Times. We begin the book like this. When fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in the, in the American flag. This prophetic warning, variously attributed to author Sinclair Lewis and Louisiana Governor Huey Long, could have been written about post 9-11 America. 
Using fear, electoral fraud, and the smokescreen of terrorist attacks, the Bush administration has given us a lesson in how quickly a nation can be hijacked and core tenets of democracy trampled. Who would have imagined that once sacred principles of liberty, the right to a fair and timely trial, the checks and balances that keep our political leaders from being dictators, the freedom from arbitrary detention, the international prohibitions against torture and wars of aggression could be thrown on the scrap heap so quickly. President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney have asserted the president's right to wield virtually unchecked power. They have used the tragedy of 9-11 to implement a radical political agenda, attempting to ram through a right-wing wish list, from gutting Social Security to delivering tax cuts to the rich, to discarding basic civil liberties. Our government now routinely invades the privacy of its own citizens, then pulls the cloak of national security over its operations to hide its deceptions and blunders from public view. The economy has been trashed, inequality is now at levels not seen since the Great Depression, and at least five million more Americans live in poverty than did at the start of the Bush presidency. Many eminent historians and economists are concluding that George W. Bush has earned the distinction of being the worst president ever. Where is the outrage? The US corporate media and the Democrats complain politely and then resume their deferential posture to enable the next disaster. The media, so helpful in launching the Iraq war by acting as a conveyor belt for the Bush administration lies, has shifted targets and now passes along White House propaganda about Iran. But these things have not gone unchallenged. And I, I should add a little anecdote. As I was uh, coming from the airport, arrived in uh, Seattle on Friday, um, being uh, a cheapskate that I am, I'm always looking to share rides and taxis. So at SeaTac, I run out and I see some guy about to step into a taxi and I uh, run over and yell, you, you mind if I join you? So <laughs> I jump in and he's a British guy. He just arrived here. So uh, as we're t chatting, it, I, you know, obviously turns to what do you do? And he says, uh, uh, I work for a defense contractor. Uh, he's <laughs> I said, oh, really? He's, he's from uh, the UK, and he's uh, got a British, you know, thick British accent. He uh, works in surveillance and spy equipment and this kind of stuff. So I said, so what are you doing here? And he says, well, I just came from, uh, from a, a conference in, in uh, Ottawa. I said, oh. I, he said, and anyway, then we get talking about what I do, and I said, so uh, were there many people to greet you there? He says, oh, yeah, a lot of protesters. I said, he, I was silent. I said, like, what kind of things were they saying? He says, they're calling us merchants of death and things like that. And uh, so I said, so, and, you know, what'd you do at the conference? And he said, well, we're talking about, uh, of course, he was saying, well, we're talking about the war on terror and, you know, how it's going to, you know, just, uh, there's many more terrorism attacks and there's going to be more and more. And, and uh, basically, we're at the highest alerts. And I said, what do you make of that? And he looked at me, he says, bunch of rubbish. He says, it's, he says, it's just, just a smoke screen, mate. He says, these guys are selling lots of stuff. I said, so you don't believe there's any increase in terrorism attacks? He just laughed. He said, not at all. He said, they're just reporting things more now than they used to. And, uh, you know, the two of us looked at each other, and as we got out, of course, he'd been doing very well, so he paid the entire cab fare. <laughs> He also told me, now when you go and talk to these people you're going to talk to, he says, you make sure you got bribed by, tell them you got paid off by a defense contractor. <laughs> um, and uh, he also said, he says, oh, I, I wish you good luck. He says, you know, you, he says, the stuff you're saying is all true. He says, but you're going to put me out of work if uh, you keep this up. So. <laughs> Well, back to our heroes here. As the nation's leaders have abdicated leadership, it has fallen to unlikely heroes to step forward and pick up the fallen torch of democracy. We have traveled the country to profile some of the movers and movements who are defending the core values of America. We met, and this was last year as Amy and I traveled around, 
We met librarians in Connecticut who fought off the Patriot Act, community activists in New Orleans who are rebuilding their abandoned community communities in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, psychologists fighting torture, African-American students and parents <clears throat> fighting racism in Louisiana, scientists fighting global warming, and soldiers fighting for peace. These are just some of the grassroots activists who are taking politics out of the hands of politicians and changing the course of the United States. As the Bush administration has waged war abroad and at home, it has catalyzed a vast groundswell of political action. Like rivers converging into an ocean, these movements from across the country and the political spectrum have united and are swamping the traditional bastions of power. Bush triggered this political tsunami now Republicans and Democrats alike must reckon with the power of this grassroots uprising that is wresting control of our country back from the corporate profiteers, ideologues, and religious zealots. Newly minted and mobilized activists and movements have helped to counter the current regime and will have a major impact on future elections. Great change begins with small steps taken at home. Our book chronicles and celebrates the actions and visions of America's real movers and shakers, the people who have defended democracy in the face of an intense assault. We've sought out these heroes in schools, military bases, homes, and neighborhoods, and we hope that by highlighting some of the grassroots activism going on around North America, readers will see themselves and their communities in these stories. We uh, end our introduction by talking about uh, the uh, title of our introduction is We Shall Not Be Silent, which is a theme that runs throughout our book. It's a phrase that was coined in Nazi Germany by a resistance movement called the White Rose. The White Rose was um, a group of students uh, and a philosophy professor by the name of Kurt Huber. Um, the leaders of it were Hans and Sophie Scholl, a brother and sister. Uh, they were actually devout Christians um, who saw what was going on in a country where the media was completely controlled, dissent was stamped out by the Nazi government. And so they began mimeographing handbills in which they described what they were seeing that was not being reported in the papers and on the radio. And one of their most famous leaflets uh, concluded, we will not be silent. We are your guilty conscience. The white rose will not leave you in peace. We feel like in the stories, now Hans and Sophie Scholl and Kurt Huber were tried, caught by the Gestapo as they were distributing their leaflets, tried and executed on the same day. They were beheaded by a, a so-called people's court. They. Today in Germany um, are in the pol polls that have been done rank as the, uh, among the most admired Germans in the history of their country, ahead of uh, famous literary figures and Bach and others. Many, many buildings and streets are named after Hans and Sophie Scholl and Kurt Huber. We feel like the spirit of the White Rose is very much alive and well, and that while these stories are not rep often not reported by the corporate media. You hear them on Democracy Now!, you hear them on KBU, and you hear them on public access cable and other independent media. And we have to continue to take great strength in knowing that we are determining the course of this country. That when elections are happening now and the pundits are, are surprised by how Suppose seemingly inevitable candidates are being upended by others and, and they, they haven't been able to figure this out. You know what's going on. You know that it's movements in your own communities that have mobilized against the kind of crackdowns that are controlling, increasingly controlling the levers of power and we have to increasingly demand that these new politicians, whoever they are, be accountable and ask the hard, we have to continue asking those hard questions. One of the stories, uh, some of the stories that we tell, we have a chapter called T is for Terrorist, and these are uh, stories about a new breed of terrorists that poses 
a threat to our nation that could potentially bring this country to its knees. Those are the people wearing t-shirts, of course, with political slogans that the government doesn't appreciate. We have a whole chapter on people being hauled off to jail, kicked off airplane flights for the t-shirts that they're wearing. Maybe it's because of what the t-shirts say, maybe it's because of the color of their skin. Some of the racial profiling and, the, and we document the backlash to it has occurred in this neck of the woods, so we thought it only appropriate we share these two stories with you. Racial profiling stories just keep rolling in. In August 2007, the FBI in Seattle released a photo of two Middle Eastern looking men on a ferry, or maybe they were Italian or Latino, whatever. The FBI trusted people to make the connection that these men were up to no good. The men had been spotted, quote, exhibiting unusual behavior while riding ferries and were, quote, over overly interested in the workings and layout of the boats. A ferry captain snapped the photo. One man appears smiling, but the other, who bears a striking resemblance to 9-11 hijacker Mohammed Atta, don't they all, is shown looking menacingly at the camera. The FBI said the men were taking photos and looking around the boat. The feds asked local media outlets to broadcast and print the photos in the hopes that someone could identify the men. The men were not suspects in any crime. Standing on the ferries, you know how shabby the scenery is on those ferries around Seattle. I can't imagine what they could have been taking pictures of or being so overly interested in, you know. This looks like the Staten Island Ferry to me. Um, suspicion about a couple of brown-skinned guys. That's all it took for TV stations and the Seattle Times to plaster the city with the images of the men. But the Seattle Post Intelligencer, to its credit, refused to publish the photo. Managing editor David McCumber explained in the PI, quote, we have no confirmation that these men's behavior was anything but innocuous, and to forever taint them by associating them with terrorism under these circumstances is not consistent with our policy. Months later, the men had not been identified. PI columnist Robert Jameson Jr. wrote, quote, the authorities had fear as an ally. The feds enlisted the public like Orwellian lackeys to be the eyes and ears of agents who have wrongly singled out people before. Brandon Mayfield learned what happens when you are falsely accused. A lawyer in Portland, Oregon, and a convert to Islam, Mayfield was mistakenly linked by the FBI in May 2004 to a fingerprint found near the Madrid terrorist bombing two months earlier that killed 191 people. Despite the insistence of Spanish authorities that Mayfield's fingerprints did not match what they had. But the FBI, using the expanded surveillance powers of the USA Patriot Act, had all the evidence it needed to convince itself of Mayfield's guilt. Phone calls that he made to Islamic charities and incriminating evidence that agents took when they broke into Mayfield's home without his knowledge. This included a Koran and, quote, Spanish documents. Turned out to be his son's Spanish homework. <laughs> Mayfield, who has been an outspoken critic of the Bush administration and its war on terror, spent two harrowing weeks behind bars. He was shackled, chained, and placed in a five by eight foot maximum security cell. He was allowed out for one hour per day. Within hours of Mayfield's arrests, headlines blared his crime and linked him to one of Spain's worst terrorist crimes. Mayfield told Democracy Now! Quote, the suspicion leading up to the arrest, the arrest itself, and the time I spent in jail in shackles and chains was the hardest time that myself and my family have had to endure ever. Mayfield was ultimately exonerated and received a rare public apology from the FBI. He declared, I believe I was singled out and discriminated against because I was a Muslim. Mayfield took his fight for justice further, suing the federal government for false arrest and challenging the legality of key parts of the USA Patriot Act that permitted secret searches and wiretapping. In 2006, a court awarded him $2 million in damages for the false arrest. And in September 2007, in a major blow to the Bush administration, an Oregon judge struck down two pillars of the Patriot Act that the FBI used to conduct warrantless searches against Mayfield.
U.S. District Judge Ann Aiken wrote, for over 200 years, this nation has adhered to the rule of law with unparalleled success. A shift to a nation based on extra-constitutional authority is prohibited as well as ill-advised. Stalked, vilified, burglarized, terrorized, locked down, isolated, and exonerated. This is the real face of racial and religious profiling in the United States. Unlike Brandon Mayfield, many victims are not fortunate enough to be freed. As columnist Robert Jameson observed, when ignorance meets fear and simple actions become freighted with the worst of intentions, that's when it happens. Innocent people become criminals in the minds of those who see only skin deep. Well, we go on in our travels, and um, I'll, I'll leave you to read more in the book. Some, one of my favorites, uh, as we talk about improbable heroes, are these uh, librarians from, the Kinet from Connecticut that I mentioned earlier. Um, these, uh, Amy and I went to meet them in their local public library. These are, um, these librarians uh, opened the door one day to fi F find FBI agents at their door who wanted names and uh, information about everybody who had used public libraries and their computers in the suburbs of Hartford, the Connecticut capital. And the librarians said no and fought and fought and fought all the way to the Supreme Court. They were locked down in their homes, they were gagged, and they wouldn't stop fighting. The case became bizarre and Orwellian as they were, as plaintiffs, suing the federal government. They were the subject of something called a national security letter. It's kind of like kryptonite. If you receive an NSL, and over 150,000 people at least have received these, the moment you open the envelope and read the letter, you are immediately gagged and uh, uh, barred from telling anyone, even a spouse or a family member, that you are the subject of a criminal investigation. An investigation launched not by a judge, but launched by a low-level FBI agent, basically a corner cop. Uh, so with very little to go on, they have these draconian powers and you don't even know about it. You don't even know that all around Portland, people are gagged right now, cannot speak about the investigations that they are under, that the FBI is waging. Well, these librarians, when they sued, their case came up, and being uh, branded as some of the leading terrorists in the nation meant that they weren't even allowed in the federal courtroom in their own trial. So they were locked in a storage room in a federal courthouse in Hartford and watched on closed circuit TV the proceedings. One of the things they saw, people didn't know their identities. They've been identified, they were identified as John Doe, Connecticut. All they knew was that librarians were in the dock and were fighting like hell against the US government. And they saw on the closed circuit TV which was aimed over the shoulder of the judge, the entire courtroom packed with librarians from all over the state. When they appealed their case and had to go to federal court in Manhattan, they had, once again, their identities couldn't be revealed. They were told by their lawyers they had to dress like lawyers. They could not be perceived to be librarians, so, you know, no <laughs> little badges and whatever else, uh, you know, pocket protectors and, uh, you know. They had to come in separately. They could not look at their lawyers so that no one would suspect who they were. And they had to blend in with, in the room. Once again, they found this Manhattan courtroom packed with librarians from New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, simultaneous with the hearings on the steps of the Capitol. A protest was going on organized by the American Library Association where librarians marched around with gags in their mouths. Um, they finally won their case and became four people, the only four people in America to beat back a gag order of, under the Patriot Act, the only people who can speak about the crackdown that is underway all across the country. So you, you have to read this story to fully appreciate it. I'll just conclude with uh, how we conclude our book. 
Ordinary heroes teach us that democracy can and must be defended everywhere by everyone. We are the leaders we have been waiting for has become a rallying cry of the climate change movement. This spirit of resistance has the power to save our democracy and our world. The German students of the White Rose warned in their first leaflet, quote, it is certain that today every honest German is ashamed of his government. Who among us has any conception of the dimensions of shame that will befall us and our children when one day the veil has fallen from our eyes and the most horrible of crimes reach the light of day? That veil has long since fallen in America. The crimes, racist arrests, war, illegal surveillance, torture, roundup of immigrants, to name a few, are happening in plain sight. These violations will not simply stop with a change in leadership in Washington, unless we force an end to the crimes and the criminals. Democrats and Republicans alike have been served notice that lip service and deception will not satisfy the new generation of activists that is demanding real change and real democracy. Now more than ever, it is imperative that we defend our liberties, speak truth to power, fight for those who can't, demand peace and end the bloodshed, and save our struggling planet. Now more than ever, and always, we must stand up to the madness. Well, I can think of no better note to hand over to somebody who has been standing up to the madness before many people even knew there was madness going on. For 12 years, Democracy Now! and my big sister Amy uh, have been speaking truth to power, and we are all the wiser and luckier for it. Here's Amy. ridiculous rumor. Don't you know you have to confirm every rumor that is out there? Oh. Well, it is such an honor to be here and to follow my brother. Arthur asks what it's like to be David Goodman's sister. I think that's a very good question. Um, David inspired me to go into journalism. When he was eight or nine, and I was 10 or 11, he started Dave's Press. At eight, Dave, or six? Something like that. There were signs all over our house pointing up the stairs to his room, Dave's Press. <laughs> And he'd somehow convinced my parents to let him get a Xerox machine, the kind that if you pushed with all your weight um, on the kind of netting, it would burn the image of Day's Press into the next page and the next page. And that's how he reproduced the newspaper for the larger uh, good person family. And he was extremely opinionated. Um, there was a raging debate in the letters to the editor section of the newspaper <laughs> about the Vietnam War. And David always stood his ground. Um, he, it was sort of like the rest of it, the newspaper was like a glorified family calendar. Uh, until he would say something like, Wednesday, March 1st, mom spanked Amy. <laughs> And then my mother got mad and said, David, you cannot 
publish the dirty laundry of the family. And David cried censorship. And the thing is, he really cried because he was eight years old. Uh, but the letters to the editor page was really a place for the larger family to hash out these issues. We had an extremely conservative great uncle. Um, our, all our great uncles like worked in the garment district um, in New York. And he would battle my other great uncle. They lived together in an apartment with their wives. Um, they played games together. They loved each other. One was a socialist, one was a conservative Republican, and they were locked in struggle for 40 years. <laughs> and they would debate on the pages. My grandfather would write in and say, Duvidal, I am so proud of your newspaper, but your position on war is wrong. And David would write back, dear grandpa, thank you for being the first subscriber to my newspaper, <laughs> but your views about the war are stupid. And so we always saw journalism as a place to engage in civilized and not so civilized debate. I was the one who would slip the newspaper under the doors of my brothers and my parents and demand the one cent that they owed. I think it was a cent a year that they owed and they were never paying up. So it inspired me too to go into journalism. My older brother too was active on the high But, so it was my younger brother who actually in the high school newspaper and we all followed suit. But journalism is so important. I mean, in that time in high school, it was our way of holding the principal accountable. And then we just moved to a larger stage. But there is a reason why journalism is the only profession explicitly protected by the U.S. Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. And that's absolutely critical in these dire times. When you think about the way the media has failed us today, it is not a minor problem. The media are the most powerful institutions on earth, more powerful than any bomb, more powerful than any missile. And the Pentagon's deployed the media, and we have to take it back. Yeah. And you're doing it here in Portland. The fact that you have your own radio station, KBU. Don't take it for granted. Not every community does. As well as Portland State Radio, as well as Portland community media, public access. These are precious public spaces that people have fought for, taken from the media moguls um, who are taking over so much of the precious national resource that are the public airwaves. They're ours, guys. They're not theirs. I mean, the fact that weapons manufacturers like General Electric, which owns NBC, use the airwaves doesn't mean they own them. They simply lease them. And if they do what they did in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, which we see repeated now, even as they do their mea culpas, how did we get it so wrong on WMDs beating the drums for war now with Iran? But when you look back at the lead up to the invasion, just go back about five weeks before the US bombed Iraq, before Bush bombed Baghdad. It was February 5th, 2003, Colin Powell was Secretary of State. He made his way to the UN and made that push for war that convinced so many because he was considered the reluctant warrior, the one who had to be convinced. 
And then he presented his array of evidence, in quotes. And you think about what the media did, how easily they could have ripped it apart. But who did they turn to? In the two weeks around that February 5th, 2003 speech, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting did a re study of the four major nightly newscasts. And these newscasts matter. As Noam Chomsky says, they manufacture consent for war. The NBC Nightly News, the CBS Evening News, the ABC World News Tonight, and the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, the four major nightly newscasts. There were 393 interviews done around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Guess. Don't underestimate the person who said two. Three. Three of almost 400 interviews were with anti-war leaders. That's not mainstream media anymore. That is a media beating the drums for war. It doesn't represent mainstream America because those who are opposed to war, those who deeply believe in peace and fighting for it are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media and we have to take it back. And we see these heroes all over. I mean, as we travel, it has been amazing. I mean, you can't go a day without seeing someone who has stood up in their own way. Um, I began in New Orleans. It's where David and I begin the book. You have a major American city abandoned by our government. How could it happen that we experienced in the 21st century the drowning of an American city? Yes, Hurricane Katrina hit hard, and yes, the levees broke, but that was only a part of the disaster. You had President Bush and his ranchette in Crawford. It was the end of the summer, one of the longest vacations in presidential history. Did he race off to be in command and control? No, he raced off to California to get this photo op with a country music star whose signature song was Wish You Were Here. Could have been the theme song of the people of New Orleans. And then he races back to New Orleans? No, to Washington to be in charge? No, back to his estate. We won't call it a ranch because it isn't. Vice President Cheney in Wyoming continuing fly fishing, Condoleezza Rice in New York taking in Spamalot playing tennis with Monica Sellis and doing high-end shoe shopping at Ferragamo. A customer yells at her, what are you doing when people are dying in New Orleans? And they take her out, the customer that is. <laughs> Where was the Bush administration? Well, the corporate media actually did the right thing in that case. They went down to New Orleans, as they should. And something very interesting happened with the Bush administration not responding, not sending in the troops to help most of them in Iraq. Right, where was the Louisiana National Guard? We went down, we interviewed National Guardsmen, many of them and their equipment in Iraq at a time when there was so much need at home. So what happened without those coming to the aid of their neighbors? Well, the media went down and there were no troops to embed with. And we saw something so rare we saw a media unspun, unfettered, at ground zero, reporting, responding, showing the images in a way we don't see with Iraq. Remember watching television, if some of you do here, and seeing the images of the bodies floating by. 
I remember seeing a young CNN reporter talking to a man who came up out of the water holding his boy, saying he'd been holding his wife's hand, and as her hand slipped away, she said, take care of the children. He turned around, still in shock, and walked away, and the young reporter started to cry. That's reporting from the victim's perspective. That is unembedded reporting, and it galvanized this nation. Could you imagine if for one week we saw those images in Iraq? We saw the babies dead on the ground, the women with their legs blown off by cluster bombs. We saw the soldiers dead and dying. For just one week, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. But we don't see those images. And that is what's unforgivable. Because when you have hundreds of channels and you don't see the real images of war, and even from what we were seeing after the invasion, now five years later, hard to believe we've entered the sixth year of the war, hard to believe the US has been involved in Iraq longer than the US was involved in World War II. But when you don't see those images and there's less and less coverage and yet there are hundreds of channels, you start to convince yourself maybe it's not that bad. And that is the problem and that's why we have to take back the media. And we have to hear from the people who have stood up. I mean, just being here, on the one hand there's Bonnie Tinker, her mom, who recently died, Lorena Tinker, is the woman Supreme Court case was based on, Tinker versus the Des Moines, uh, Des Moines Community School Board, standing up for her kids, for Bonnie's sister and brother, who in 1965, calling for the Christmas truce in Vietnam, wore black armbands and were kicked out of school. And so this case goes to the US Supreme Court, and they win. We've got heroes right here. And then there's Nan Rich, mother of Sarah Rich, who I was just with in New Orleans a few nights before, grandmother of Suzanne Swift, a remarkable young woman in the military, gets abused in Iraq, comes back, has to go back to Iraq, and stands up by saying no. By in standing up, she is not only standing up for herself and for all women in the military, she's standing up for all women. She is standing up against violence against women, and that's what thousands of women did this weekend in New Orleans. Uh, Eve Ensler took her V-Day on the road and there rented out the Superdome, calling it Super Love. It was truly a super home for tens of thousands of women streaming through from New Orleans, from the New Orleans diaspora. I mean, oh my God, we're talking about a diaspora of residents in the United States from a particular city because their city drowned and continue now, years later, not to be able to return home. To see the more than 1,000 women coming from Atlanta and from Houston, from all over the South and some places in the North, making their way into the Superdome, 1,200 of them this weekend, Friday morning, some limping in, some getting help by others coming in, in so much pain still, but welcomed home to the Superdome, transforming that place of so much tragedy where the government there and at the convention center completely abandoned them, now coming back to reclaim their dignity with women from all over the world, from Croatia and the former Yugoslavia, women from Eastern Congo who are taking on the rapists, where rape is standard procedure in that war, is used as a tool of war to suppress half of the population. 
women coming from Haiti, women coming from Kenya, women coming from all over Latin America, coming from Afghanistan and Yanar Mohammed coming from Iraq, talking about the repression of women under the new so-called Iraqi government. It was truly a remarkable moment on Saturday night. I was sitting with Nan's daughter, Sarah Rich, Suzanne's mother. They are a powerhouse of a family. As we were high up in the arena, looking out on close to 15,000 mainly women saying no to violence, saying yes to women experiencing their power, and through that, transforming the world. There is tra uh, change afoot in this country. We could have gone on writing and writing this book with stories all over the country and all over the world, but the publisher said they had to put the covers on and they had to put it to bed. So I guess, well, the next one will just begin on this trip. But one of the stories in our book is called Psychologists in Denial. Now, we're really honored that Democracy Now! broadcasts on KBU every morning at 11 o'clock, a daily grassroots, global, unembedded, international, independent news hour. And also, we're, I'm doing a column that's distributed by King Features that goes into mainstream newspapers around the country. Very excited it's in the Seattle PI and also right here in the Oregonian. And we hope that you let your newspaper know that you appreciate when they bring out different voices. But the last column um, that I did was about a New York psychoanalyst named Dr. Steve Reisner. Now, he's a very interesting man. He's the leading dissident over the last few years around, well, the largest psychological association of psychologists in the world, the American Psychological Association, the APA. It has almost 150,000 members, and it's remarkable. But over the last few years, it's been ripped apart by a struggle over whether psychologists should be allowed to participate in coercive interrogations, military and CIA interrogations, at Guantanamo, at Bagram, at Abu Ghraib, at CIA black sites around the world. Now the American Medical Association and the smaller APA, the American Psychiatric Association, have said no. They have barred their members from participating in these coercive interrogations, but the APA, the American Psychological Association, has refused to ban their members. They have a large military component, a large military contingent of psychologists, but it goes beyond that. And there has been a movement, very small at the beginning, that has grown. In fact, we begin standing up to the madness with that quote that has so often been attributed to Gandhi. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. And I think we're seeing these stages of progress in the American Psychological Association. The APA administration has been fighting this growing group of dissident psychologists. You know, it's a huge organization. Most psychologists don't even know what happens within this association. They often join it just to get insurance. But because it's so egregious what it has come to represent, there are many that are starting to refuse to pay their dues, that are quitting. A leading psychologist turned author, Mary Pfeiffer, some might know her from Lincoln, Nebraska, who wrote in the middle of, is it everywhere or nowhere? And is famous for writing, reviving Ophelia, won the APA Presidential Award 
And after hearing the psychologists like Reisner and Steven Soltz, who has a fan, really interesting blog that keeps you up to date on all of this, she, on Democracy Now!, she returned her presidential award saying she did it with great pain, but she couldn't accept from an organization that was condoning torture, that was allowing its members to participate. As one of the leading proponents of the current APA stance, Colonel Larry James, who leads the psychologists at Guantanamo, stood up at the APA meeting in San Francisco where Democracy Now! broadcast for days this summer. Um, he stood up and said, but we're doing this to ensure that the interrogations are safe, that people don't get hurt. And another psychologist from Dallas stood up in the midst of this debate and said, what are you talking about? Who are you keeping these prisoners safe from? It's you who are in charge. It's the US military. And if we have to keep them safe from the US military, we shouldn't be there at all. It was a small core group. They got bigger and bigger. This summer, they tried to pass a moratorium on psychologists' involvement. And ultimately, they lost. But in February, there was a slight change, an amendment, that tightened the rules. And now, Steve Reisner has decided to run for president of the APA. He has now won in the first go-round of the nomination votes of the top five nominating, nomination uh, nominated candidates. He has won the greatest number of nominating votes, over a thousand. And the real vote will take place in October. So we'll find out who becomes head of the American Psychological Association about the same time that we find out who will be president of the United States. We hope that torture will be a key issue in both elections. It really does matter what we do in our lives, the decisions that we make. It really does matter because well, one of the things we document in the book is this is happening in all walks of life, in all different professions. Whether it is the librarians standing up and fighting back, who would have thought that the librarians are the freedom fighters of our day, protecting the privacy of their patrons? You may not know because they're not allowed to talk about it or could be thrown in jail, but there they are that shh, the shushing we know about librarians, well, it's happening to them, but they are standing up. They are standing strong. We see it with the psychologists. We have a chapter in that same section, Science Under Siege, called Some Like It Hot or Don't Like It Hot. And it's about scientists like the NASA climatologist James Hansen, one of the leading scientists in the world, is paid for by our tax dollars to find out what's happening in the world, the crisis that the globe now faces. And he finds himself in a very odd situation as he does his groundbreaking global warming research of being handled by a kid who claimed to have graduated from college but hadn't exactly done that. His claim to fame was that he came out of the Bush campaign. I don't know if he was, was it 23 or 24, Dave? When he was put in charge of James Hansen's access to the media, he would decide who he would speak to and who he wouldn't. And then you have the staff of the White House Council on Environmental Quality that is deciding the research and the reports that get out to the people of this country. 
that is run by the lobbyists for the American Petroleum Institute and the oil corporations, vacuuming words like global warming off of government websites. This is all being done in our name, which means, of course, you can turn it around. And that's what people like scientist James Hansen has done. And as we make our way through this country, on Earth Day, we'll be in Washington, DC, speaking with yet another ordinary hero in extraordinary times, Dr. James Hansen. We figured that would be the place to have this environmental rally. Uh, in the power capital of the world, and make no mistake about it, what we do in this country around global warming has the biggest effect on what will happen all over the world. Yes, the US is still the number one superpower. Let's be that superpower for good, but that's up to us. And then there are the kids. We have a chapter called Voices in Conflict, the name of a play that a group of children put on high school kids, young adults, I should say, from Wilton High School in Wilton, Connecticut. Well, actually, that is the town in Connecticut that was the story of the Stepford Wives, where Stepford Wives was based. Because one of the residents who grew up there, Ira Levin, who recently passed away, um, wrote The Stepford Wives based on Wilton, Connecticut. Here are these kids, wrote a play with their teacher based on the voices of soldiers coming home and soldiers writing home from Iraq. And they put these quotes together, strung them together, crafted them as a play. Didn't think it was anything particularly controversial. They do a play every year at the school. Until the principal came in and said they could practice it. They could perform it for each other in rehearsal. But they would not be allowed to perform the play for the school. The kids argued. They were surprised. They were angry. They were shocked. They pushed the principal a little more, and he said, that ship has sailed. And so the kids sailed right onto the New York stage. A New York Times article alerted the public theater and the culture project in New York, and they invited them to places that many actors dream about going all their lives. And there were the kids performing for hundreds of New Yorkers and soldiers who'd come to see what these kids had to say. It was truly remarkable to see them standing there. But they were sad as well as we interviewed them going out into the New York air late at night saying, this is so exciting, but how come my friends can't see it? How come the kids I go to school with can't see us performing? But they did it. They stood up. And each time someone stands up, it is saving someone's life somewhere. That's what we have to remember. In addition to these stories of scientists, of librarians, of kids performing plays, of soldiers who say no, we have turning points in the book of moments in history where people stood up or sat down for all of us, like Rosa Parks. And I've told this story before, I think, right here in the Baghdad Theater. But of course, everyone knows who Rosa Parks is. And yes, even kids. And of course, it's told in the media. Rosa Parks, the woman who on December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, um, sat down on the bus and in so doing stood up for all of us, not just African Americans, but all of us. Because if one of us is diminished, we are all diminished, challenging segregation on the school buses, saying no to a uh, white bus driver that she should get up and a white male passenger should sit down. That night, Joanne Robinson, an African-American activist, mimeographed 35,000 flyers to urge people not to ride the buses of Montgomery until they were desegregated. And a few days later, when Rosa went to court, the Montgomery Improvement Association had a mass meeting to lead this boycott and elected, chose a young minister who'd just come into town to the Dexter Avenue Church 
a young Dr. Martin Luther King to be their spokesperson. So Rosa Parks helped launch Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, when the media told her story last year when she died, oh, it was amazing. Um, we went down to Washington, D.C., Democracy Now!, to um, the Capitol Rotunda, the first African-American woman to lay in state there. Then she was brought to a Washington church, and then this funeral, her body was sent back to Detroit. In this church, thousands of people came out. Oprah Winfrey was inside, Cicely Tyson was inside. Outside, well, that's always where it's most interesting to be. Thousands of people, kids who brought their mothers. We talked to a young uh, college freshman. She said she emailed her professors that day and said, I won't be in class, I'm going to get an education. We talked to a 91-year-old African-American woman who was way in the corner by the street. They were listening to the loudspeakers. And she said she had sat down on the bus before Rosa Parks, not in the south, but in the north, clinging to a book she was pretending to read as the bus driver said, you get up now. Yes, women had sat down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama before Rosa Parks did. In fact, Rosa had sat down on the bus before December 1st, 1955, in the front of the bus refusing to get up. But this was a magic moment, right? This is when it all came together. And this is why activism matters. As you lay the foundation, you're never quite sure when it's actually going to be a turning point. But if you're there laying that foundation, which often takes years to build, you will help direct the progress, determine how history becomes the future. And that's what Rosa Parks did. And the way the media told the story at that time as they remembered Rosa Parks, they said, you have to understand, she was simply a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker, they said. But that's where they got it wrong, because Rosa Parks was a world-class troublemaker. <laughs> She was the local secretary of the NAACP. Edie Nixon was the president. He came out of radical labor politics. Together, they'd been challenging segregation for years. She went to the Highlander Center to train where blacks and whites together worked to fight racism in the South. She had been doing this for years. She knew exactly what she was doing. That's not the story we get from the media because they denigrate activism. But what could be more noble? than to be an activist, to get, dedicate your life to making the world a better place. And to show how brave Rosa Parks was, we just go back a few months in 1955 to that deadly summer when Emmett Till sent down to Money, Mississippi by his mother, Mamie Till, to be with the family, was lynched, was killed by a white mob, not clear, two white brothers, not even fully investigated half a century later. But he ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. And when his body was dredged up and sent back to his mom in Chicago, she did something incredibly brave. Mamie Till, Mamie Till Mobley. She said that she wanted the casket to be opened for the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. And that image was seen by thousands of people who streamed by young Emmett's casket. And the photograph of his distended, mutilated, tortured head was published by black magazines like Jet and other publications and was seared into the history and conscience of this country. Mamie Till Mobley had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. And then we can decide what to do. That is our job, not to sanitize. When we had Aaron Brown, a former CNN anchor on Democracy Now! for an hour right around the time of the invasion, we asked him, why isn't CNN showing those pictures of war? And he said, it's a matter of taste. 
I think it's war that's tasteless. I really look forward to signing books with David in the back and whether or not you get books to talking with you. It was wonderful at the reception to sit with people and really hear what you have to say. Um, and if you get two books, by the way, and they're wonderful to give as gifts, um, and also uh, it's wonderful to work with Powell's. This really is a center of independent media. We can't underestimate the power of independent bookstores. So often they go out of business and yet Powell's is going strong and we have to keep it that way. But if you get two books, we're gonna give you a moment in time that just happened about two months ago in New York. It was our 12th anniversary, Democracy Now! Uh, on the air for 12 years since the 1996 election. We went on television uh, right around September 11, 2001, and the show has really taken off and is now <clears throat> broadcasting in over 700 stations around the country and the world. Our headlines also available in Spanish for any radio station to take in audio and transcript form. You can read them on our website. Um, but on February 20th, we had this amazing celebration. Willie Nelson came out, and um, Jackson Brown performed. Danny Glover was there, going back to the uprising at San Francisco as a college student. In a week, by the way, we will be doing a special on the Columbia Uprising. You know we've been doing the series 1968, 40 years later. Sarah Jones, the Tony Award winning actress, uh, was there. Dick Gregory, well, Dick Gregory is just amazing. And he also spoke, and Juan Gonzalez, who himself will be coming out with a book, who I, which I hope everyone reads about racism in the media, also was there. Dennis Moynihan introduced him, who is our outreach director, been with us from the beginning, moving on to become CEO of Free Speech TV in just a few weeks. And I hope you all uh, let people know about that remarkable independent satellite network that is so important in keeping uh, independent television alive in this country. But this two-hour DVD we are offering as a gift if you get two copies of the book. And if you don't get any copies, that's okay too. If you want to get one copy and pass it around or get two and give one to a library so people can afford it, can get a copy or whatever. Um, that's what we'll go to the back and do. And tomorrow we'll go on to San Francisco and Sebastopol, and then we head to Houston to celebrate KPFT, the Pacifica station there. That station that's the only one in the country when it went on the air in 1970 was blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. Truly amazing story. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter, sort of backfired. Who had money to advertise that this little Pacifica station was going on the air in Houston and the Klan just uh, blew it into the consciousness of the people of Texas. And, and when, and when, um, when KPFT got back on the air, they blew it up again, and that just cemented its presence in Houston. And now we're gonna be celebrating uh, KPFT there for now some 38 years. Independent media is so important. Pacifica and the Pacifica affiliates and places like KBU are there as a model, the vanguard for stations all over, not just this country, but around the world. They are what is going to save us. I deeply believe that having and protecting and preserving a media and building and growing a media that advocates the building of bridges, not the bombing of bridges, is what is going to save us. We live in a globalized world. We are so insulated when it comes to getting information in this country, except when you live in a town, in a community that has independent media. We have to challenge the corporate media and build our own media, and that's what you've got right here in Portland. Our second book, Static, we called Static, and I'll end with this. Because in this high-tech digital age, with 
high-tech media, digital radio, high-definition television, all we still ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. When what we need is the media to give us the dictionary definition of static. And that's criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate and not for the state. We need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. Democracy Now! You've been listening to David Goodman and Amy Goodman reading from their latest book, Standing Up to the Madness, Ordinary Heroes in Extraordinary Times. Amy Goodman and David Goodman's other books include Static, Government Liars, Media Cheerleaders, and The People Who Fight Back, and The Exception to the Rulers, Exposing Oily Politicians, War Profiteers, and the Media That Love Them. Amy Goodman is co-host with Juan Gonzalez of Democracy Now!, the syndicated news and analysis radio and television program now aired on over 650 stations in North America. David Goodman is an investigative journalist, a contributing writer for Mother Jones. His work has appeared in The Nation magazine, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, and many other publications. To tune in to Democracy Now!, visit the Democracy Now! website at www. Dot democracynow.org. You'll find listings of community radio, public and campus radio, and public access cable television stations that carry the program. Or you can tune in via the streaming audio and video available directly through the website. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www. Dot pdxjustice.org. You'll find streaming video programs featuring speakers such as Naomi Klein, Susan Faludi, Jeff Halper, Rashid Khalidi, Amira Haas, and many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.